Hello everybody, welcome to my broadcast which is called China, the chess game and uh, what, what are the key chess pieces. Now as you know I recorded this before a few days ago, the sound quality was horrendous which was very disappointing because I think that the general content was was great so I'm re-recording this hopefully the sound is a lot better uh, luckily I managed to get my uh, old laptop working again but I want to don't want to go on about housekeeping issues because if you're watching me for the first time or you're watching this you really want the information you do not want to hear about my technical issues so why I'm talking about China is because those who watch my channel regularly will know that I made some predictions about China about um, a year or so ago. And one of the main, one of the few thing, few things I said about China was one that there would be a, an outbreak of something like a virus happening within China. I also talked about the sleeping giant in China and what I think is the resurgence of Christianity or religion in China as something for the ordinary people to latch onto to give them hope to overthrow the oppressive regime. What I'm seeing in China is that the authorities they are getting edgy. There's a huge influx of people from the rural areas into the towns. These sorts of huge social changes create instability. Instability is always a threat. What I've said also is communism tends to last about 70 years and then it falls apart and I think the Chinese Communist Party feel that no matter how much I'm going to explain here that they are uh, projecting influence in the rest of the world due to this key chess game that they're playing. Internally that's their biggest challenge and I think the biggest uh, thing that we have to look to in the rest of the world is although it's almost checkmate in terms of their power, within the Chinese people have the power within themselves to overthrow that oppressive regime and do the whole world a favor actually and I think they will through religion which is think why I think in the recent months We've seen this incredible crackdown on the Uyghurs, on the Christians, uh, taking uh, all Christian symbols out of homes, even forcing people to replace pictures of the uh, leader of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping, in place of crosses, etc., etc. They seem really nervous about religion. Now, when I did my broadcast on why capitalists love communism, I talked about how the communist ethos, the communist mentality, which is almost a kind of Satanism at heart and the more you go into it the more you uncover that saw Christianity as a massive threat and that's why they've tried to undermine it in the United States in the rest of the world you know China own Hollywood Hollywood is a key tool by which they undermine Christianity China's got a finger in many pies including the media you'll always hear the media dissing Christianity or belief or religion in general even comparing religion to some kind of uh, mental illness that's how far they'll go and not only that, is the communists infiltrated the Catholic Church, bringing about the paedophilia. In, I'd say the communists have also infiltrated the Church of England, because what we hear coming out of Justin Welby and the Archbishop of Canterbury are heresies. He's not defending the faith. Even Prince Charles, who will, as monarch will be the defender of the faith, is talking about being a defender of faiths. So within the Christian community, our leaders have deserted us, our leaders have become traitors, just as all our Western leaders have become traitors as well. Many are in the pocket of the Chinese Communist Party. And I'd like to emphasize when I speak about this, my issue is with the Chinese Communist Party, and I think very few democracy and freedom-loving people have a lot of truck with that regime. I have great sympathy with the people in China who I think I'd offer them my full support in bringing about a better China with more democracy and more freedom etc etc. So within the chart of China I also see a problem with aging population, increasingly poor health, increasingly low productivity and I think all these problems are really upsetting the regime plus Donald Trump has provided a certain amount of pushback. Not enough because I think people are asleep to what China's doing and that's why I've got the map up. I know some of you guys get disappointed because you'd rather see me but sometimes I just want to show the map so that I can explain totally what I'm getting at with China. I also think that when we look at China, I think it's going to be the new Indian century. I think China have been on the up since 1979 when George Bush Sr. and Kissinger were there putting in deals, putting in place certain deals. We had the Clintons, the China Gate scandal. We had this flow of uh, technology to China, of uh, you know, of all these IT firms basing their productions in China, China having back doors in all these bits of equipment. We have here, um, you know, Israel, which control Intel, and that 
Intel in terms of Intel Pentium processors. Uh, they've been doing a lot of deals with China as well. They can feel China is becoming more and more powerful. They're aligning themselves with China. They're sharing technology with China. And this has all helped China make incredibly rapid progress and become almost a superpower. But I think that's almost on the way now. And I think India is the country to watch. India's got a great deal of people who are very savvy in the IT and technological industries. Loads of uh, Indians going over to work in MIT, etc., etc. So I think that India is the country to watch. I think it's could they could overtake China, particularly because they have a government who were very savvy and aware. Modi has this nationalistic style, but he also understands the threat of China. And I don't think a lot of people in the West do. So he's alert to it. He's prepared. I wouldn't underestimate India at all. And India, along with the Chinese people, could be the, the linchpin by which we take back control and don't allow China to dominate. Now, when people talk about the Chinese students, a lot of whom go to universities in America, go to universities in, in the UK, it's usually going to be the members of the Chinese Communist Party that get out. People who are resistant to the regime, who are not part of the Chinese Communist Party, don't tend to prosper as much, don't tend to even get out of China as a country. And so when we're looking at people who are um, over in the West, Chinese people, they possibly members of the Communist Party, when they're infiltrating in universities, becoming more and more powerful in universities, there's, they are, that knowledge is inevitably going to be tapped for the Chinese regime. And hence, you have this infiltration and this grip on intellectual property and often the pilfering of intellectual tr property by the Chinese regime. So as I talked about in my blog on why capitalists love communism, I said that behind the Bolsheviks were senior bankers, some of the biggest bankers, people who were part of the Federal Reserve, and the key industrialists in America sponsored communism. You had all the biggest companies in America, General Electric, General Motors, Caterpillar, um, was, it, was it Lockheed, not Lockheed Martin, I think it was before their time, but um, McDonnell Douglas, all the key industrialists in America sponsored communism. They had factories running in the Soviet Union. And where did the Soviet Union, how did they progress so fast? How did they get their technology? It was via concessions and agreements with key United States industrial companies. And the same thing has happened with China. They've been able to rise so quickly, not because there's a lot of um, innovation going on or entrepreneurship. It's because they've been able to tap into all the technology in the United States because so many companies and political ideologies there are complicit with the Chinese, particularly the Clintons were involved in transferring technology. Even the Jeffrey Epstein scandal, when Jeffrey Epstein was donating so much money through Leslie Wexner to Harvard, that was also a way of harvesting information to send across to China. So it's not that they've developed quickly because they've had help with the West because there's a certain group within the United States, within Europe, who are Maoists, who have absolute sympathy with the Chinese model. And after the failure of the Soviet Union, they are now using China as their, their incubator for the new global world order. It's their testing ground. It's the place where they're testing the technology, like the social score or, or, or the social surveillance, etc., to be rolled out. Just as back in 1917, they were going to test out communism in the Soviet Union to roll it out everywhere. And when the Soviet Union fell, did it really fall, or had it really, or had communism metastasized in such a degree all over the United States through the media, through universities, through the institutions, that it had actually become unstoppable and you no longer needed the Soviet Union from which to project power. So now I'm going to be talking about how China is projecting power. And when I'm talking about the Chinese Communist Party, I'm, I'm bearing in mind that they are in league with the elites or whatever you want to call them, the, the Illuminati, the, the secret cabal in the, that operates in the Western world. Now remember, China, who helped them build their firewall that stops people in China from having access to the wider internet? It's Google. Who is it that helps them with facial recognition and all these things? It's Facebook. So the biggest companies in America your Googles, your Facebooks, your uh, Apples, Tim Cook of Apple. They're all working with the Chinese. They're not only taking advantage of slave labor and unfair working conditions in order to get their products made cheaply. They are also helping China build this oppressive surveillance state and all the infrastructure that goes around it. 
So when we're looking at China, it's not just their system. It's people in the West helping build that system. So they're building it in China to roll it out to the rest of us, right? Um, they're all in on it. So, and when you hear about Apple and they don't want to give the FBI or the CIA access to some potential terrorist phone or the back door into the phone or get past the password to get into the phone for evidence in a trial, do you think that they tell the Chinese government the same thing? They probably say to the Chinese government, yes, sir, right away, we'll have that information for you. Okay, so there's just this asymmetry with how the biggest companies deal with China, how they deal with the rest of the world, and how they are in bed. So we've got an alliance between the Chinese Communist Party, in some cases the, the uh, technology firms in Israel, and some of the biggest uh, industrial leaders and elites in the United States and in Europe. And we know there are many allies in the European Poland who are actually Maoists, right? Okay. Mm. So let's just have a look now. When we talk about, when people have talked about World War III, they always said, how will we know when World War III has started, right? When will the sh first shot be fired? And the problem is people always think well, the war, the next war, will be fought like the previous war. So in World War II, they thought, oh, it'll be fought in the trenches like World War I. And it didn't work out that way. It was mainly fought from the sky, with the Blitzkrieg, etc. And now people kind of use World War II as their template for World War III, but that's not how it's going to be. In fact, World War III started a very long time ago, and this is when I'm going to come to South Africa. It's absolutely no coincidence that the apartheid regime only ended after the fall of the Soviet Union, coming down of the Berlin Wall and the fall of all of communism. Prior to that, the Western countries like America and the United States were largely should I words use the word supporting the apartheid government? Partially because they needed access to the vital resources that were available in South Africa. So the Western leaders understood that while apartheid was a bad thing, the ANC government, led by mainly Nelson Mandela, there was also Walter Sisulu from the Communist Party, heavily involved, Joe Slovo, who was operating out of North London, um, a KGB agent who should have been sent back to Russia, but Maggie Thatcher was allowing him to operate out of North London, uh, coordinating the uh, Soviet arming of the ANC and the training of Encanto Assis, the, uh, the uh, army of the African National Congress. So while, it was part, while the ANC were fully funded by the Soviet Union and had Marxist ideology, there was no way that they could allow apartheid to fall because they would lose access to the vital resources in South Africa, which could have fallen into the hands of the Soviet Union, providing a checkmate for capitalism and the West. But that same thing is going on now. But anyway, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the ANC and Nelson Mandela no longer had their support. Therefore, MI5 and the CIA went out there had a big talk with Nelson Mandela, told him he better change his tune. He better align himself with West. He better drop all this talk of Marxist-Leninism and keep South Africa roughly how it was, which is how it has remained until now, when China are pulling exactly the same strategy. But now, because South Africa has a weak government, a very corrupt government, Along with a lot of Africa, there are weak governments, and that's what China does. Just as the old Soviet Union, they infiltrate countries which are very poor in economic crisis, failed states like Somalia, which you can see there. Countries with a lot of debt like South Africa, who can't afford to maintain their electricity infrastructure, who need nuclear power, etc. And they are almost colonizing these countries and gaining access to their resources. So why are South Africa's resources so damn important? Well, Let's have a look. Let's have a look. South Africa produces most of the world's platinum. It comes from an area near Rustenburg. You guys have heard of Sun City. It's not terribly far from there. So South Africa produces most of the platinum. Russia produces the rest of it. Between the two countries, the platinum industry is virtually sewn up. If China has a monopoly on South African platinum, which it's doing by buying up mines and controlling mines, it's, it, it, it can actually disable the rest of the world. Why? Because you need platinum for catalytic, catalytic converters. So that's all the cars. You need it for uh, laboratory equipment, for electrodes, for dentistry, for petrol refining, for chemotherapy, for turbine engines, for oxygen sensors. Platinum is so important because it's not corrosive, right? It's extremely durable. They use it in the aviation industry extensively. They make fuel nozzles with it. They make turbine vanes. Um, in addition with palladium, palladium, of course, which is also available in South Africa. So without an access to pal um, 
platinum. What is the rest of the world going to do with its auto industry, its airline industry, uh, making military equipment, everything for the military? You see how important it is they can cut off the rest of the world from a vital supply that would allow these countries to not only run their economies but to defend themselves. In addition, South Africa uh, is a key place where chrome is mined. You can't make steel without chromium. So chromium mining, extremely important as well. You know, China are making most of the world steel. They're getting a monopoly in steel by producing steep, cheap steel, running all the steel factories in America, like in Pennsylvania, out of business, also in Wales, in the UK, etc., etc. So through their control of chromium and through their undercutting of steel to get a monopoly in steel manufacturing, China are also beginning to dominate steel. Another important uh, game in the chess game that they are playing. So also in South Africa, vanadium. Another key mineral comes from an area called Brits. Largely, vanadium is absolutely vital to nuclear reactors. What are we having built in England, in Hinkley? Probably a nuclear reactor being built by China. So they're controlling our nuclear industry. And if they control vanadium, no one else will be able to build new nuclear reactors um, without this vanadium that is mainly made in South Africa, some in other places as well, produced in South Africa, should I say. So here we have another problem. As I've said before, most of the nuclear reactors in the world are well beyond their sell-by date, which is 25 years on average. We need to build more, can't do it without vanadium. Uh, vanadium is also um, a catalyst used to produce, to produce superconductor magnets, and I don't believe you can do electric cars without these superconductor magnets. So let's go on. China has a huge population. They need extra resources, they need extra land. What are they doing? They're doing a lot of illegal fishing all of the South African waters. They are overfishing these waters for their population. So they are encroaching on other countries in terms of fishing rights. Farming, they're taking over farms all over Zimbabwe, uh, Botswana, etc. Uh, presumably to produce for their country. They've had a lot of droughts, they've had floods, they're having a big problem with their own um, crops in China to feed their population. So it's no doubt they're going to be again encroaching on the resources of other countries. Uh, in China, you know, with electric cars, some people are really keen on them. But a lot of the rare earth minerals that need to be mined for the batteries of electric cars, it's extremely toxic to mine them. And one of the only places these are mined in China is in China, because in other countries, uh, there are too strict regulations to even mine these things. They are using child labor in many cases, and they are poisoning the environment by mining these rare earth minerals. So that's why China also needs farming land in places like Southern Africa, because they are contaminating the resources in their own country. That's why I also think electric cars are a very bad idea, ill thought out, it's giving more power to the Chinese because they're the only one who mine these things. So again, they'll be our sole producer. If they cut us off, there's no cars because they, we won't be able to remake the batteries. So again, it's the supply chain reliance on China, which we saw through COVID is very detrimental to the world economy. So, and of course, we don't want to be encouraged pollution in the environment by mining these rare earth minerals. So there you go. Okay, so as I say, the war has started. The key chess places, the key chess pieces are in place. They've, they've basically got control of South Africa. Uh, because the government is weak, it's corrupt, it's running out of money, uh, it's, it's becoming bankrupt. They can't afford to maintain the electricity infrastructure. They need China to buy bulk power stations, etc. South Africa is totally controlled, as is Zimbabwe, for similar reasons, and some of these other countries. As you know, Somalia is a, a failed state, so it's giving China access to this vital area of sea and here uh, access in, to, through um, past Yemen. A lot of what's going on in Yemen also suits China because they would like to control this whole area here because of shipping. And that's what they're getting control of as well. Now, you see me here, I've circled the Panama Canal. It's one of the important seaways that China own. They own the Panama Canal. They own here in Greece a lot of deep water harbors. That's the way they are also controlling world shipping, right? If they can control these key areas like here, what is that called? I've forgotten. Is it the Gulf of Aden? <laughs> I don't remember what that's called going into the, the Red Sea there. Um, if they can control that area, they're also controlling traffic up to the Suez Canal. So they control shipping. They're controlling shipping by controlling the Panama Canal. They're controlling this whole area here, South China Sea. So they're getting a monopoly on controlling world sea traffic. Okay. 
what else have they got control? They've got control of Hollywood, so they're controlling the output of Hollywood, the propaganda, and also the vacuous celebrities that run around Hollywood spouting all sorts of woke nonsense that suits the Chinese. Hollywood is very destructive to the morale of the United States, to the perception of the United States. Um, it promotes degeneracy and filth, which of course um, is again contra to Christianity. It undermines the moral fabric and the social fabric of a country. It's all key to the takedown of the United States. It's the enemy within. Then you've got people like uh, Colin Kaepernick. I mean, he doesn't care about his career in sports because Nike is sponsoring him and uh, the Chinese are giving him um, a deal worth millions and millions and millions. And that's basically at the heart of what he's carrying out. Again, it's undermining American culture. It's all the takedown of America, which is what this is all about, along with what's going on in Portland and Seattle, all this sort of thing. That's all sponsored by the elite cabal in the United States, and it's all paving the way again for infiltration by China. You see, I've got Venezuela circled there. Obviously, the Maduro government, the country's in a mess, another failed state partially, and definitely a communist sympathizing state. Uh, they have essential resources, loads of, of oil and important things like that, and other minerals. If the Chinese get control of it, they can project power into South America, and they've got control of these resources. If you look there, they've been doing massive infrastructure projects in the Balkans. As you've heard me talk about, China do this thing called death tra trap diplomacy. They lend vulnerable countries with not a lot of money, for example, Sri Lanka, um, uh, is it uh, the places in the Balkans, places here in East Africa, they lend them a lot of money. They, China dictate which infrastructure projects they should invest in, whether it's dams or bridges or ports. Sometimes it's not even an infrastructure project, as with Sri Lanka, that's going to uh, positively benefit the locals. It's usually an infrastructure project that's positively going to benefit China. And what happens? The taxpayers have to fund this project when it can't be funded anymore. Uh, they declare that, that they bankrupt and what happens is China just take possession of the whole infrastructure project, which means they own it, which is terrific. That's what they've been doing around the world. So why have they got Iran circled? Well, Iran, you know, they're not the greatest friends with America. Therefore, they are allied with China, despite what's going on with the Uyghur Muslims. Plus, the Persian dynasty have, have in the past, over thousands of years, had, well, I don't know about thousands, but a thousand or so years ago, the Persian dynasty had a lot to do with China. So there's this history between the countries. Therefore, there's some trust because they feel they've dealt with each other over millennia. So there's a lot of trust there. So they are cooperating together. Iran is a key a country on the Silk Route or the Belt and Road Initiative. Lots of oil and gas resources, um, a fairly sophisticated country in terms of education. So another key chess piece here. So you've got your chess pieces, your key ones, South Africa, also key for shipping with the Cape of Good Hope past here. You've got Venezuela and South America, Panama Canal, Hollywood, uh, Turkey, where they do a lot of gold processing in Turkey. That's also important to the Chinese. And let's move over to Ireland. Now, I've heard that in the next 15 years, the Chinese will be the biggest um, popular, biggest m ethnic group in Ireland, which is quite surprising. Now, Ireland, and I've also got Iceland circled, are key because they are islands. There's great potential for ports, for the Chinese parking their military, and for the from Ireland, the Chinese can project power across to the US and Canada and over to the whole of Europe. So Ireland is absolutely a key chess piece to them. So is Iceland because of the natural resources. As you know, Norway is very oil rich. This whole area is potentially extremely rich in oil and gas reserves, and they can project power off to the Bering Sea and to the Antarctic, uh, not the Antarctic, the other one, the Arctic Circle. So you can see that's another key chess place. In Ireland, the mayor of Dublin is now Chinese. Their Ken Caller, which is their Speaker of the House, who's called Sean O'Flaheel, he's at the Chinese Embassy every five minutes frequent trade missions to China. He is certainly a powerful Chinese ally within Ireland, driving this whole thing. So therefore, 
the Irish really need to take back control of their country because now with COVID and with economic problems, Chinese are buying assets at bargain basement prices, not only strategic assets, but also things like hotel and things in the leisure industry. So China is becoming a big force. Then, of course, we've got Huawei. And apart from now, luckily, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, the US, and I think it's also Canada who've rejected Huawei only because Donald Trump is alert to the threat and he has threatened all these other nations. Otherwise, they would have just gone along with it saying, yeah, yeah, isn't it wonderful? You know, the chief exec in of Huawei, who's a British guy working in Britain, he was saying, oh, oh, Huawei doesn't want to steal your intellectual property. Huawei's got nothing to do with the Chinese government. It's like, does he think everyone's born yesterday? Do we think we're just going to, he think we're going to take his words at face value? Is he out of his mind? Obviously, everything that goes on in China is heavily dependent on the CCC. P, who have board members on every company, who have a close eye on what's going on, especially in a strategic industry like G5. Then, of course, as I say, China's got an ally at the moment because Israel is cozying up to China, obviously, because the Israelis realize their big ally, America, who's always been their biggest donor and backer, they're becoming weakened and they're looking to align with someone more powerful. But I'm not sure if that's really going to come off for them. I've got Australia circled because, as we know, and my subscribers in Australia know, the Chinese, similar to Ireland, have been buying up both politicians and assets in Australia. It's a key farming area. The Chinese are buying up farms in order to gain access to food supply and for strategic reasons Australia is also very important. Now I believe the Americans have an extremely strategic defense unit out in Western Australia so I don't think the Chinese are going to be going near Western Australia because I think Americans will certainly defend that but out in Eastern Australia they could be gaining traction. I would say states like Madagascar who have traditionally been Marxist, been poor, poorly governed and lots of scope for corruption also possibly under Chinese control. And we know these states like Kazakhstan are also involved in the death trap diplomacy with China. So we know what's going on with the farmers being murdered in South Africa. And once again, I'd like to say this whole concept of creating starvation through food shortages by targeting farmers was done three times under the Soviet Union, the Holodomor in Ukraine. And there were two other Holodomors where due to the establishment of quotas or the uh, what do they call it? The uh, commune, putting the, co the collectivization of farms in Ukraine, it devastated the farming industry, leading to massive shortages and to starvation in which 7 million people died in the Holodomor in Ukraine. And as I say, there were two more in Russia. So this whole uh, game plan of destroying the far farming by, you know, having farmers murdered or by quotas, or by collectivization, or by some other Marxist technique, leads to starvation, which leads to population reduction, which, as you know, eugenics, it's a very big thing all over the world. Let's look at Ireland again. The potato famine was another induced famine in order to um, do population culling. So we need to look out for it and watch our food supply very, very carefully, because this is what the elites are engaged in. They never, I mean, there's never a new story. Everything that's going on with China is what was going on in the Soviet Union, which was actively sponsored and, and helped in both in technological ways and through other support by the key industrialists out of the United States. Hence why capitalists love communism. Capitalists in the sense of the uh, fascistic capital corporatists, should I say. And they're all working together. So what else have I got there? I've talked about Ireland, Panama, Sri Lanka, Turkey, Venezuela, the oil. So uh, in a way, it's, it's something we should all be aware of. Look at all my circles. These are all the chess pieces. And we're very close to checkmate in terms of the Chinese control. But the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn has led to a big awakening. And I think uh, Donald Trump, I don't know what he's doing with these masks or the vaccines. Don't agree with him there unless he's got some plan. We don't know about it. Unless it's 3D chess, as they say. But what he is doing is he's recognized the threat of China. He is pushing back. He is having an effect. And I really do hope that the resurgence of Christianity can help give the people of China a moral and a spiritual courage to rise up against this before it's too late. And it's almost too late for them because of the social score, the limitations that are put on them, uh, the absolute crackdown against dissidents and anyone who speaks out. It's very hard for them. 
but they're, they've got strength in their numbers and maybe they can just topple this thing because even when you know communism seemed unshakable it was eventually toppled and once it's toppled i think we can we can get back control but it also relies on people in all these countries just waking up speaking out getting rid of the politicians who are so in hock to china undercovering covering corruption you're know, looking at um, what assets china is buying up why that's happening put pressure on your government still use your voice in your democracy while you have it because the cc the Chinese Communist Party it's an unhealthy regime and not only are they unhealthy the technocrats who want to bring in this worldwide system of, of technocracy across the world are also very unhealthy people we need to overthrow this whole system we need to reclaim our world from these crazed megalomaniacs with their sick ideas of reprogramming our DNA through this mRNA vaccine, then using D G5 to adapt our mitochondrial DNA to turn us into something, I don't know, what we are being turned into, something that is anti-human. Um, here we see the whole transhumanism agenda shining through as well. Not to get too much into that. I've got a vlog coming up, which will be live, me chatting where I draw a uh, comparison between something that was happening at 500 AD and something that's happening now. There was a massive shift in, shift in human consciousness at around 500 um, before Christ, sorry, not AD, BC, so 500 years before Christ, 400 to 500 years before Christ. There was a change in thinking, a change in philosophy that shaped the next 2,000 years. And right now, we are seeing a similar massive change that's going to shape the next 2000 years. I'm going to compare and talk about what happened at 500 BC and why it was important and then I'll talk again about why it's important now and draw some comparisons and throw in some astrology as well. So I, I truly hope, I'm going to be so disappointed if the sound was abysmal on this, I truly hope that the sound was better this time and that you enjoyed this. I've added a few extra things due to questions I had about the polonium, the polonium, the platinum. I hope I called it platinum the whole way and didn't bloody call it polonium or something stupid. The platinum. I answered some questions on that and just tried to clarify some issues due to questions I had. I'm going to do one more of these where I chat with visuals and then I'm hoping to do a lot more where you see me because I know you guys all prefer that. It's just because of a lot of like... Uh, home remodeling and essential maintenance in in our home i'm so limited with space and time to do the visuals and sometimes it's quicker to do these non-chat ones so thanks for that guys